In 23 years of broadcasting, I thought I'd seen it all, folks. But it looks like Lou Diamond has actually blindfolded himself before doing this podcast. I don't need to teach you to be more like me. I need to teach you to be more like you. You. Longtime listener and a huge fan. Lou, I am tremendous. And the more I'm plugged in technology and people, the more I can serve people with technology. What you're standing for with connection, I think it's the key to everything. You're just an amazing breath of fresh air for sure. Lou, you're, you're a diamond in the rough, my man. Because for me, if I'm not living high energy, I'm surviving and I want to be thriving. Get ready to thrive loud with Lou Diamond. I love it. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Thrive Loud with Lou Diamond, connecting you to the most inspiring and amazing people that are thriving each and every day. I'm your host, Lou Diamond. Today on Thrive Loud, we have an award winning speaker, best selling author, and founder of Think, React, Lead. He is a master at building strong teams by using effective communication, diversity, and rapport. He's a strong believer in vulnerable leadership and enjoys sharing real-world insights that will help both leaders and team members achieve bigger goals today and also build new leaders for tomorrow. Thrive Lab listeners, get your ears tuned up because we got smoky, smoky, smooth sounding Dom Fawcett here on Thrive Loud. Dom, how are you today? Outstanding, brother. Thank you very much for the invite. I am definitely looking forward to this. This is Friday. It was the highlight of my my week today talking to you. So thank you. So this is what you call the uh, the clubhouse romance or bromance for that matter. Uh, you exactly. Know, people, people said, wow, Lou's got a good voice, but you haven't heard Dom. And we're going to talk about all the things that he does. And then I heard him and I'm like, oh, my God, this guy's incredible. And obviously, as a professional speaker, author, he and I have this overlapping world. So I want, I want to focus on what he's got going on because he's doing lots of really cool things. Let, let, let's just start off with um, the main thing. Tell me what you got going on right now. What's the world of Dom look like today at the time we're recording this? Today, at the time that we are recording this, I have just signed my, my third year contract to be in radio. Um, huge fan of radio. It's not going anywhere. Uh, and I, I launched a program called passion to profit. And when I say program, it's a embodiment of everything I've done as a, a speaker. I came into the game in this entrepreneur game at the age of 37. I'm 43 now. And I just wasted a lot of money and I did a lot of things, but I, you know, I, I wouldn't say wasting because I've learned a lot and, and coming in more mature, I've been able to, I take a lot of notes and I've been able to put all that into a program. It took five years, but there's so many people that don't really know where to start, but I think everybody has a passion. And I, and I'm, I train people to speak, and I'm very passionate about speaking. So trying to lump all, all that in, I think everybody should be a public speaker because they, everybody has a product. That's just, I'm, that's my jam. But mm -hmm. the passion to profit thing that we're, we're doing, it's taught me how to be less aggressive I'm an ex-cop prior military uh, in, in my training and, and, and more, if you will, passionate towards the people that are just getting started. So that's for me, that's new from a teaching yeah. and facilitation style. That's not my, uh, my go-to, but we're always developing. And that's, that's really what I've got going on. Like in the moment, as we're speaking, that that's the hot, that's the stuff on the, on the stove. Yeah. By the way, and I, and I didn't know the, the military background and police background, which is pretty cool. And it, it, actually, it actually explains a lot of things. It filled in a lot of holes from my <laughs> little research here. Uh, and, and, and you just said something that I thought was really interesting, but I'm going to hit it right now. And that is, you know, when, when people start entering the speaking world, it's a unique animal onto itself. And there's, it's almost like drinking from a fire hose and right. You probably mm -hmm. spent money the wrong way, figured out the wrong thing to do, but eventually you find your own path. Do you find some irony in the fact that you're actually helping so many newer speakers enter in to the market? There's something funny about that. You're like, wait a minute, you know, I came in late at this and now I'm actually helping those people that I wasn't in that seat too long ago. I find, I find the irony in the fact that I've, I've been stuttering since I was in first grade. So from five and a half, Till I was 21, like I saw a therapist twice a week, a speech therapist twice a week, all the way through my senior senior year in 
high school. And I got into law enforcement after the military. When I got into the corporate space, people would say, Dom, you speak so well. I'm like, I speak so well. Did you not hear like the, do, do, do? Like, did, you, did you not hear that? Cause I felt it and I'm embarrassed. And I'm at the time I'm 28 years old, <clears throat> but I had practiced speaking for so long, had been trained to speak properly for so long. The irony is in the realization that I know a, a lot of science behind talking, speaking yeah. and communicating, which none are the same. And we are good at something you just think everybody knows how to do it. So the irony for me is, how do you not know how to introduce yourself on stage? How do you not know how to throw your throw the the vocal cords in your voice so you command presence on a podcast or a radio show or television? And then how do you not know how to make somebody laugh in less than three seconds? Right? These are things that are normal to me, but now I'm in a space where I can train people on how to speak. I didn't realize people were afraid to speak. And and I've actually read, and I don't know if this is still true, that some people were more afraid to speak publicly than to actually die from something. Or, that's actually, what they say. I don't know. I don't know if that's a hundred percent true. Yeah, that might be one of those statistical things where they throw out a question and they basically be like, "What are you most afraid of?" And the first thing they respond is, oh, "I'm afraid to speak in public." And then they go like, "Well, what about you know dying out of a plane?" Well, of course I'm afraid of that. Right. But like, I, I've seen people. Option. I've seen people die. <laughs> Like in front of my face and on their way out, they're not saying, man, this is better than speaking. Like, that's just not, those aren't the words that come out of their mouth. So I, I don't know where they got those statistics from. Oh, I love that. Uh, but interesting, I, my, my sister is a speech pathologist and she works oh, wow. with young, yeah, she works with young kids and you know, who have real, you know, real, not only communication issues, but lots of other um, there's 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 occupational physical issues around that. Mm -hmm. And and I've really, as you just said, understanding the science of it is one piece. And she's an expert in this area. Uh, but by the way, whoever your speech pathologist was that you were seeing all those years, um, could could you be like the greatest poster child for the work that she ever does or he ever does? Oh, definitely. Because, I mean, spectacular. Maybe share with the listeners, um, uh, talk a little bit about how you use your voice um, professionally, because not everybody is from the area that you're in. They don't all hear you. So tell a little bit about the, the specific radio profession that you've been doing for quite some time now. Radio started by way of a speaking engagement that I did in Texas. And somebody walked up to me, long story short, said, hey, you should do radio. And I've heard you should do radio my entire life. But I'm like, why would I do radio? Nobody. I don't sound like this. Good morning. This is like, I don't sound like that naturally. <clears throat> and I came to back to, to, to Arizona and I met the guy and I, I started trying some things out. And what I found was all these network events that I would go to where there's a bunch of podcasters, which podcasting is not easy in itself. The moment I mentioned, somebody introduced me as, hey, this dummy's got a radio show. All eyes, all the attention came to me because it's, nobody knows a radio show host. And it's, there's true. still this antiquated thought process of, oh, he's got to know what he's talking about if he's a radio show host. So there's some, there's some like not even A, B or C level, D level celebrity status that comes through somebody's perception of who I am because I'm a radio show host. And I plan on doing it in a year, but it's to help my business out. Yeah. And it got me comfortable speaking to an audience that I couldn't see. It was an audience you couldn't see, but I would also imagine that on your program, did you ever have to do interviews like we're doing right now? Oh, of course. I strategically do two interviews a month uh, on my show, and I do an hour of talk just for Dom Fawcett. And I, I leverage radio because with the podcast if I had it at my home, I'm not as big as you are. It's weird for me to ask somebody to come to my house and do a podcast. Like, they're not going right. to come. But for a radio show, not only will they come, I, I charge most people to come to, to my studio. But radio is not cheap. So yeah. it's I've leveraged the heck out of radio. And anybody listening can go to any small AM station in their city, pay a couple hundred bucks a month. And it may not be the prettiest station, but it's a start. I think everybody mm -hmm. should be in radio to start. That's a, by the way, a great idea because it, it does a couple of things. And I've learned this from the podcasting seat. And the reason I was asking about the interviewing, I have learned how important interviewing is to how I interact to the workshops to the audiences that I speak with, because I'm very, mm -hmm. I am very involved in the audience in those conversations. And I never realized how important 
the skill of being able to ask questions was. I've done it my entire life, but I've never really realized it. And, and doing it in front of an audience, a live audience in your instance, or a recorded audience as we're doing in the podcast, gives it a whole new framework because it really does enable you to improve not only how you sound, but how you connect. You agree with that? I 100% agree with that. There's a, an, an, a phrase in the radio industry, no dead air. And while you're talking, you may have a guest that is great during the conversation that's charged you just, man, I would love to have you on my show. They get there. There's mics everywhere. There's a production team and they can't talk. You have to be able to continue that conversation. But just like being on stage, you may have a planned speech for the most part and you get there and you realize your talk is not going to connect with the audience. So you have to move on the fly. And I look at speaking as a sport. A boxer trains every day that they're, you know, a basketball, any athlete trains every day. Speaking for me is training. Radio is training. Podcast, this is training, right? Yeah. And, and because if I don't do it for five weeks and then I get asked to speak in front of 300 people, like I'm going to mess up, but I have to do it yeah. every, every day. But yes, to answer yeah. your question, you're on it. And, and I think even more importantly, you're doing it every day live. And, and what people realize is the importance of performing. Because when you're on stage and you're speaking, make it clear, it's not like we can hit the edit button and record and say, oh, we could scratch that out and go do it. No, no, no. We, mm -hmm. we're, we're here. We got to keep the show moving. No dead air. To your point, right? Correct. And it's, I look at speaking, it like when I train speakers, speaking is 80% entertainment, 20% education. Yeah. And I also teach my students to watch stand-up comedians. If you want a good example of a public speaker, one, don't watch other public speakers because you'll start to embody them. But it, it, watch stand-up comedians. And the reason why is a stand-up comic walks into an audience and the audience literally has paid to come see, come, paid to laugh, but they're sitting there with their arms crossed thinking to themselves, you can't make me laugh. You probably suck. And the comedian within 10 seconds has to get, has to get chuckles. And the audience changes all the time. So I practice a, a, a make them smile, make them laugh, make them think. It's, it's a rhythm when I'm speaking. Smile, laugh, think. Smile, laugh, think. And I do that every, every 13 to 15 minutes. I do that. And it's a, it's a flow. Oh, I like that. I like speaking that is a beat. Speaking yeah. is a rhythm. People are entertained and they're drawn in by the change of my voice. And you know what I was thinking the other day? My mother came out and talked to me like I was a seven-year-old. Can you believe that? You know what? I couldn't believe that at all. Right. That rhythm makes people stay engaged with who you are. And look at what you watch on TV, like the, the, all the different camera angles and the changes and the. But most most podcasters aren't as good as you and the audience listening. I will say this. You, Lou, left me a voice message. I played the voice message in the kitchen with my mom and my sister. And my mom and sister give me no kudos for anything that I've done. But I had the speaker on and my mom and my sister stopped what they were doing. They looked at my phone. Who is that? He has got a fantastic voice. I'm thinking, I have a fantastic voice. You've never said that about me, but it's, it's, it's Mr. Lou. <laughs> People need to know that uh, his sister, um, I've mailed her a check and uh, she already <laughs> cashed it. <laughs> We're giving her a shout out and, and I'll make sure I'll sound as good as I possibly can. You mentioned this before about not sucking, but I want to talk about this, how to embrace the suck to command presence. Share with the listeners what that's all about. <clears throat> Where I got that from. Now, what I'm about to say, None of your listeners have this experience. Maybe, maybe one. There's always one crazy one that aligns with what I've done. But it, I used to kick in doors and serve warrants as a cop. And the intel would be, hey, there's two people inside. All right, cool. I don't need assistance. I know what I'm serving the warrant for. I'll knock. They don't answer. I kick in the door. We'll be fine. Well, the intel I've learned over the, as I was doing this over time was always wrong. Two goes to four real quick. I mean, somebody sucks at math, but cops aren't known for math. So... <laughs> I kick in the door. Ex except for how fast you're going on the road. <laughs> right. And then they're told by a uh, radar. So right, even point. then, they don't have to think. But it, and I kick in the door. When you kick in the door and you're expecting to and there's four people, guess what you can't do? You can't press pause. You can't say, you know what, gents, you know, my apologies. I, I've obviously come underprepared. Uh, just stand by. I'll be back in 15 minutes with backup and just leave everything out. Like that's, how, that's not how that works. You have to engage. Yes, it sucks. Um, people have died kicking in doors. But you, you embrace the suck and you command presence. You don't have to be the biggest guy, but you got to control the biggest 
challenge in the room. So let's transfer that into speaking. People are afraid to speak. Like I, people pay me to teach them how to talk and I'm like, go do a podcast. Five weeks later, they haven't done one podcast. So the embrace the suck aspect of it, when I just re- realized that, and I'll share one quick story, when my speaking became perfected, I mean, I would get on stage. Good day, everybody. My name is Dom Fawcett with Think React Lead. And today we are going to talk about the 17 concepts specific to emotional leadership, right? I, I don't talk like that now, but it, I would get on stage. And the last time I did that, I spoke in front of like 50 executives. And afterwards, the, the, the VP comes to me, he said, look, it was a great talk. It was perfect, but it didn't connect with my audience. He said, I have never heard such a perfect oration in my life. And I thought to myself, here I was running from stuttering, running from Tourette's because of my PTSD and trying to be a person that I was told to be in obviously the early 90s, late 80s. But that that wasn't needed. And when that when he said that, I, I got on stages and I would I'd stutter. It's OK. And I would tell people, hey, I stutter. Like, if you want to tease me, that's fine. We'll fight in the back. But this is after I told him I was a tough guy. But I would, I, would, I would make fun of it. And then I would just become animated and just got so comfortable. And then I realized I've embraced the sub. I'm commanding presence with the sound of my voice and then coming down and engaging the person's emotions. And command presence is something that I learned in canine school with an animal. You, you have a dog, Belgium Malmois, you're searching for a bombs. You want to command the presence in the area. Uh, and I, I've just, I use that with my clients. Yeah, most of the stuff we do is going to suck. You're going to be afraid, but guess what? It ain't going to kill you. And if it does, you're not going to know anyway. I, I love that. You just, if, maybe because of the whole radio connection, you just brought me to Howard Stern's movie, which did, you saw Howard Stern's movie, um, the first one he came up with. Uh, I have not. I didn't know he had a movie. I'm going to have to watch oh, it. Oh my God. And my brain is going to, hold on one second. While we're here, I'm going to do the, the stall thing. But uh, Howard in the movie talked about him in his radio voice, uh, private parts. Thank you. My brain just came back in. So private parts in the movie, he was showing his, it was a story, it's his whole career and he was going through all the different places. And he had this weird voice that he used to speak when he talked in front of the microphone, almost more performed and more professional. And it turned out that he read something and he made a comment like, you know, I've, I've gone to this, pl- oh, you know, he just was ad living, you know, I've been to this place. It's the best thing in the world. And then all of a sudden he realizes that the place was going out of business. It was closing or whatever it was. And he says, you know what? I'm sorry. I've never been to that place. And he was honest. And he sees his wife later in the day and his wife tells him, I want to let you know that the first time I actually really appreciated what you said on the radio was when you were being yourself and you were mm-hmm. connecting to the listeners. It was such a powerful moment. And as you were just doing that, you're right. When you have that perfect dictum, almost too great of a powerful voice, people can't relate at that level because it's no. they, want, they want the interpersonalness. They want the flaws. They want the mistakes. They want the humanity because at the end of the day, that's what we connect with. Right. And, 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 and I think as someone who is that that's the art artistry that you you deliver deliver it's even better that you can deliver it with the you know the range that you can um i think that's what you you basically provide the entire 88 key piano right Mm -hmm. you got the ability to play all the notes um but you also know where to hone in on which what people want to listen to and i love that that story about all that that ups and downs and the cadence do you realize every now and then how much better you are right now today than when you first started Oh my gosh. Let's just use radio as an example. My first, I had a jerk of a production person at this, this podunk radio (laughs) show and she hated men, hated men and hated cops. Right. So here I am. Think react lead. Thank you for watching. And all she said to me was sit down, no dead air. I'm like, no, I don't know what what's dead, dead, like dead to me is something that somebody kills somebody, not air. How can air? And I'm overthinking it. I got paper everywhere. And I start sweating and, and I, I wanted to, I was trying to be somebody, not, not that I wasn't, I was, I was trying, welcome to think react lead. I was trying to sound like this ex-cop prior military. And then I started sweating and my voice started going everywhere. That was the <laughs> longest hour of my life. But as I did it over and over and over again, really what it was, I, I ended up getting comfortable with myself and 
as I started talking on air about my PTSD and about some of the darker experiences in law enforcement, and then I started interviewing people that have gone through things way worse than I've ever gone through. One, I've gotten over myself too. I've been able to find, wow, this is like, I'm connecting with the, the world. Like these airwaves go every, they're always out there. And I, I became passionate about radio as opposed to just wanting to create a brand because of radio. Radio now, it's it's who I am. It's to the point where I'm out and about and people hear me talking. Oh, you sound like a radio, you sound like a radio guy. I'm like, well, I thank you, I am. And it's just, but it's it's so entrenched in who I am that it just bleeds through everything that I do. Yeah. And and it and look, anytime you have a, a stake in the ground and people are able to recognize you for that one component. You're mm-hmm. ahead of the game because they're knowing exactly where that can go. And and on top of that, you help people d- develop effective communication, incredible rapport. Now I want to talk about one of the other things you speak about in a very interesting in very interesting times. We're recording this in March of 2021, hopefully wrapping up this pandemic sooner than we can. Right. Um, and 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 diversity mm-hmm. across the spectrum, the, yes. the challenges that we're all facing. Uh, can you? As a black man, right, can, and and a cop, and obviously someone who speaks about this component, talk about I guess the message that you're helping others better communicate, better bring things together, and what you deliver because you sit in a driver's seat here. Literally, <laughs> we're going to talk about why you sit. Maybe not a driver's seat, maybe in the saddle or in the on the motor. We'll talk about that in a couple <laughs> of seconds for our listeners. But um, help help us understand how you're how you're incorporating Mm -hmm. the issues and matters of diversity today in your messages. I called out the elephant in the room, but I, my, my belief system is if the five closest people to you act like you look like you think like you believe like you and sound like you, you'll never grow. And I found out when I first got out of the military and then out of law enforcement, all of my so-called friends or associates were ex cops, cops, tough military dudes. And we get around, and we talk about some of the darkest things and laugh about this stuff. But it, I would go home and I'm sleeping in my closet. I had a nice house, great salary, but I'm sleeping in my closet with my Glock 26 under, under my pillow and my Benelli shotgun. And I slept there every night because that was my comfort zone. Because every time we would get around each other, we'd talk about these dark things, we'd be reminded, we'd laugh, but inside I'm crying, I'm hurting. And then I started asking myself, why, am I, why do I judge a gay guy? Why am I judging a, a Muslim? Why am I judging somebody from India. Why am I just like, I would just naturally go down the street and just start judging people. I'm like, I'm not a cop. So I don't need to like, you know, and I said, you know what I need to do? I need to start inviting people over to my house and just talk or go to lunch. And I had one of my clients, Eastern Indian. He said, they're not called Eastern Indian. He said, we're just, they're Southern Northern. I'm like, what? Get the heck out of town. And then some of my clients would start educating me. And then I just started getting to see people's hearts. And then from a leadership speaker, I go into these corporations and it, being black, I can say a lot of things on stage that you wouldn't be able to say. But it, yeah. So I, I go to the stage and I say, all right, there's 10 executives. There's five, there's, there's 55 people here. And I say, okay, there's a token black guy. There's the token female. And I said, outside of you two, the rest of you white executives, when is the last time you've had a person of color or different religious beliefs than you at your house for dinner? And they would just look like, you can't say, no, I can, because I'm not hired. I'm already paid. And we're talking about diversity, right? And it's, it's bringing these things to the table. Now, on my shows and on my platforms, I don't talk race, religion, sports, or politics, because those things don't put money in my pocket. But I do talk, of, I mentioned diversity from like the benefits of being around people who are nothing like you and how you just grow as a person. I love that thing about the, uh, the five things that you will never grow. If you, if you, if you stay in that, that zone, mm-hmm. that's so true. You just remind me, Thrive Loud, uh, former guest and an amazing speaker and good friend, uh, Tony, Ch- Tony Chapman. Tony does this thing on stage and he gets up there after a little bit and he's hitting the issues of diversity and Tony gets up there and he goes, I'm going to share with you something that you, know, you may not know. And there's a long pause and he goes, I'm black. <laughs> and, and, it gets, and it always gets a laugh, but he's doing it intentionally mm-hmm. because what he's doing is he's hitting the reset button on the room to say, we're going to open up the comfort zone and what we could talk about. Right. And we need to be having the conversation about, and you are spot on, Dom. The question about when was the last time you had someone over at your house? We have to continue 
to have the conversations and not just bring them in to our workplace or the way we do business or some right. of our casual social settings. We have to bring them into our lives. We do. And, I think, and, and that is, and that's because there again, that is, that's the essence of it all. And all those fears or beliefs and all the stuff that you said, you know, you'd be judging those people. It's so true. If we, if we just open up a little bit more. So, so thank you for that message. And oh, thank keep, you. Keep I delivering that. that. I need to hear it. I love asking guests on the show this question. I am so curious to know where this goes down. Oh boy. Uh, most days as you've got your speaking world, you are helping major clients, you are connecting people and you've come from an unbelievable story and background of accomplishment and the way you've spoken, working through the military, through the police, you on most days are thriving, but we all have days when we're not quite kicking on all cylinders. We're a little off. Of course. Mind. Yep. Dom, when you are having trouble thriving, who or what practice do you seek to get yourself back on the thriving track? That's a great question. It's uh, one of my fears up until last year. And, I, and I'm bringing this up because I've, I've, I've come to understand uh, how I'm perceived by somebody who's meeting me for the first time through social media. That they'll, they'll, they'll tell themselves he's got a perfect life. And up until last year, I, I tried for 15 years to go to the VA. The VA is the veterans hospital. You go right. to get help. And I would walk to the door and I would see some guy with no limbs. And I would just be like, man, I let him have my seat. Mind you, there's like thousands of seats in the VA, but that was my way of not addressing the issue. And, and last year, two days before Thanksgiving, uh, I just had a moment where if I don't go get help for this, like I'm sleeping 45 minutes a night, I'm having night tears. Like if I don't get help for this, like I might not see tomorrow. And uh, this was the seventh time in 15 years I went to the VA and I just forced myself to walk in. So that the, the, the answer to your question was, I realized that the power wasn't in my ability to run 10 miles or shoot, you know, great or be, be who I was in the past. The power was understanding that to acknowledge you need help is powerful in itself. And then to take the next powerful step forward to thrive into getting help is, is like next level. And being able to talk to a professional about whatever your issues are, it makes you a lighter person. Like I don't, I don't have heavy burdens on me anymore. So now if I'm going through the day and I don't live this hustle and grind life and I have a moment where I just don't feel like thriving, I don't feel like working. Well, maybe that's my body telling me or as I'm bridging the gap between my mind and my heart, Hey bro, relax now because I, we're going to need you to, we're going to, we're going to need you to double down on your energy tomorrow. So I'll, I'll go mountain biking. Um, I wakeboard, I skateboard, uh, my wife and I race motorcycles. So there, there's all these things that I can do. And, and I tell people all the time, like, if you don't, if you have a moment where you don't feel like doing it, most of us work from home, take an afternoon nap, like take a new nap, a 30 minute recharge, or I'll sit down and watch comedy. I love comedy. Just go to Netflix, pull up a 20 minute co comedy or YouTube, something to recharge you, or maybe just go for a walk. I have a dog. I'll take my dog for a walk. So I've learned to follow my intuition. If my mind, if I have writer's block, just go for a walk or go visit a friend for 20, 30 minutes if you can. So there's all the, we live in a society where people are afraid of making decisions because we're, if you go through social media, you can't take this first step unless you have a coach. You can't take this first step unless you go through this eight hour program of how to take a first step. And it's a, you know, a thousand dollars. No, like start learning to make decisions. And I, when I'm training, it's the simplest things. When you go out to eat, Spend 30 seconds on the menu, close, pick what you're going to eat, close the menu, and continue the conversation with who you're there with. Because nothing on that menu is going to kill you. But if you get in the habit of just making that decision, making that decision, it's going to help in, 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 in crucial conversations. Why most guys struggle having conversations with their spouses. Uh, mm -hmm. Business partners don't know how to bring up things that might be negative in nature. Right? Mm -hmm. It starts with your decision making into your effective communication. And then you start to understand your, like your intu intuition, your gut. Like, you know what? I'm going to take a day off. It's Wednesday. I like it. By the way, thank you for sharing that story. And it's great. And, and kudos to you for stepping into what you need and recognizing you need it, which is right, which is the first step on everything. Awesome stuff. Only well, took 15 years, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, 
<laughs> so, but you did, but you got there. Right? I did. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Let's do the admin part of the show real quick. Uh, share with the listeners all the places people can find you, websites, URLs, social media handles. We will put it on the show notes, but it always gets more engagement when they hear it directly from you. Perfect. We can go to domfawcett.com. Uh, you know what I've started doing? Give my phone number out. Okay. Rarely people use it, but it's 602-481-0650. That's 602-481-0650. And then Dom Fawcett on all of the platforms, as I jokingly say at home to my wife, Babe, just Google me. But uh, that's what I say to her, not to any of you. Instagram, Twitter, the whole everything's Dom Fawcett. Dom Fawcett, ready to go down Fun Street with me here on Let's Fun Let's Fun. do it. I love Fun Street. Okay, this is cool. I want to hear this one because this has not been selected. Can you share with the listeners what you shared with me was your all-time favorite movie? Meet Joe Black. Why does that movie connect with you? <clears throat> I didn't grow up with money. And I've seen the movie probably about seven times now. And this guy, you know what? It's an old movie. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm it's a no, spoiler no, no, no spoiler alert. Like, just, Most people yeah. have seen it. Anthony yeah. Hopkins, Brad Pitt. God, yeah. he's good looking. I can't stand them. But anyway, right. keep going. Always. But <laughs> this guy's living this, this, this life of opulence and of possibilities. And the whole time during the movie that he's going and, and love, like being in love is fantastic. And how it, it's opened him up just to being, you know, engaged in various conversations. There's a time in the movie where he's making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich in the maid's quarters uh, with one of the uh, servants for the house. And then, yeah. you know, he's getting picked up by the helicopters and living in this like huge high rise and down, you know, in New York City and just have, living a life that, you know, I, I haven't accessed yet. But when it dawned on me that he was dead. I'm thinking to myself, wow, like he had all this, these, po these possibilities of falling in love and doing the thing were there when he was alive. But many of us don't take advantage of these things. And then we get older and we have regrets. So as I'm watching it, what it, when I first saw it, it gave me hope. I'm like, wow, this is possible. And then it allowed me to, to, to be more grateful for the fact that I'm able to put my feet on the ground every morning. I'm on this side of the dirt and opportunity these like exist i don't have to be who cares i grew up poor and with all these things like now like i'm i'm not poor i have a great life but it can be greater and it, it's just life experiences and i just watching that movie and seeing how closed off he was in the beginning and how open he became and just how accessible he became to people it, it just shifted my mindset very very cool all right, so we're going to do the speed round here. I'm going to throw in an extra bonus question. Let's do it. So the way this works is I'm going to ask you something. I want the first thing that comes to your mind. It's kind of like Family Feud, but I haven't surveyed 100 people. I'm only talking to you. All right. Uh, I want the first thing that comes to your mind. These are things that make you feel good, lift you up, motivate you, make you thrive. Okay. Ready? I'll close my eyes. I'm ready. A song you love to hear or that pumps you up? The happy birthday song. A favorite food that's not a dessert? Uh, grilled uh, grilled cheese, smoked Gouda grilled cheese, lobster sandwiches. Oof. A favorite dessert? Gelati vanilla ice cream uh, with pureed green apples that have been baking for a while with a little drizzle of caramel on top. Oh my God, I'm getting hungry already. <laughs> Activity you wish you did more of? Racing my Ducati with my wife. An activity you wish you did less of? Eating. If I snap my fingers and you can be anywhere in the world, Dom, where are you? I am in Zanzibar off the uh, coast of Africa, sitting on the beach, just looking at the crystal clear water and the white sand. For the listeners on Thrive Loud, can you please share what you are wearing on your upper torso right now on your shirt so they can really appreciate your dedication to motorcycle racing? I am wearing a Ducati uh, polo shirt that I purchased from Newport Ducati. And um, let me, there's a reason why I wear this. I wear this because I understand how people perceive certain people. I am a black male, but I also I'm wearing snakeskin cowboy boots right now as we speak as well. <laughs> and I, I do this with intention when I have meetings and places to go to which I do later on today, people recognize the Ducati brand with, they think their bikes are more expensive than they are. And then most people have never seen a black guy on a Ducati. One, two, they've never seen a black guy in snakeskin cowboy boots. You put the two together, 
now, and I do this on stage as well, they can't focus on how I look because their mind is all screwed up. Like I, I can't put him in a category. So it makes them ask questions outside of their ignorance. Interesting. Now with my ignorance, I want to talk about the motorcycle racing. You race with your wife. When, um, how long have you guys been doing this? So I, 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 I don't, I, I've been told I have to say I track because I don't, I don't right, race. Right. In my yeah, mind, I understand. I'm racing. Like I'm totally By, by the way, hold on a second. To, to me, someone who's only been on uh, a Harley Davidson once in his life and just went literally riding around a, a, a big <laughs> parking lot, you're racing to me. So right. that's okay. Exactly. Okay, so, fair enough. How long have you and your wife been riding? We've been riding since uh, for five years coming up, six years. A week Amazing. after I, I met my wife, we go to, uh, I was looking at a Ducati and I said, hey, just come to, to the dealership with me. So I see the bike that I want. And I said, man, you would look great on the back of this bike. And she looks at me and says, I will never ride on the back of a man's bike, but I will buy that one over there. What is that? And she bought it. And from that day forward, like we bought the motorcycles, we've been riding. Our license plates at the time said power couple. And we've hit a bunch of, we got married on them. Actually, Ducati is that, those pictures helped my brand grow because I wasn't on social media prior to meeting my wife. Look at that. And by the way, spectacular. Um, I got to hang out with her and, uh, and awesome. kudos, yeah, and kudos to you, man. I think this has been great uh, listeners. You'll, you'll get to check out all the fun images on the podcast art, even some video clips we'll, we'll share in social media here. Dom Fossette is the man. That's what I'm glad we did this. I'm totally Likewise, glad. Brother, thank you. That. Uh, thank you for coming on thrive a lot. Thank you for doing what you're doing and, uh, keep the message strong, man. And uh, one of these days we will be in person. I'm, I'm coming down. A, you gave me the invite. I'm taking it when I, next time that I'm Arizona, oh, I'm just tell I'm me you'll be on you the up. show. You'll be you on the show. A, definitely. Spectacular time. Dom, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you, sir. And to all our listeners out there, thank you for joining us. And until next time, keep thriving onward and upward. And remember, be brief, be bright, be gone. You've been listening to Thrive Loud with your host, Lou Diamond. Head on over to Spotify, Good Pods, or wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe and listen to all of our incredible episodes. Follow Lou at Thrive Loud everywhere on social media and head on over to thriveloud.com to connect directly to Lou and learn how you and your business can thrive loud too. Thanks for listening.